It's about time I talk about some of the most daunting football memories I have. That's right, the United States 2018 World Cup qualification campaign. Hey, hey! That's right, of course there's a quick plug. Hey, one football, or uh, you know, mystery football kits if you want. Join my Discord server today! Interact with many other people infatuated by the game that brings us all together. There's plenty of channels to discuss different topics or interests, and I'm always working to improve the server based on your feedback. If you want to join the community, the link is in the description. And if we can get this video to 250 likes, I will get another video essay out sooner. I know it's a lot, but I believe in this community. Although being eliminated by the developing golden generation of Belgium that totally wouldn't fail at winning a single trophy for the next seven years, the 2014 World Cup was a step in the right direction for football in the US. Viewers new or old to the sport were gathered at watch parties and bars being inspired by performances the US displayed against giants like Portugal and Germany. And who could ever forget the storyline John Brooks header that sent the nation into a frenzy as the Americans finally got their revenge against Ghana. Now one year later, the World Cup 2018 qualifiers were on the horizon. Even if they did lose 2-0 to Guatemala, the US finished top of their group in round 4 of the CONCACAF qualifiers, which locked them into the infamous HEX. For those of you who don't know what the HEX is, it's basically just the final round of World Cup qualifiers in CONCACAF. It consists of one group of six teams. After the final round is over, the top three automatically qualify for the World Cup, while fourth place goes on to the Intercontinental Playoffs. The US had finished first in the last two final rounds of CONCACAF qualifiers, so they were hoping to make it three in a row by the end of October 2017. The US squad had a lot of questions going into the hex. For keeper, there was past prime Tim Howard and a 32-year-old Brad Guzan. Fullback was the biggest of them all. I mean, it really says a lot when Fabian Johnson is not only your best left back, but also your best right back. And listen, he had superb versatility. But Fabian Johnson couldn't just stretch across the entire width of the pitch like Elastigirl or some shit. There was also young bright talent DeAndre Yedlin, with great attacking ability, blistering pace, and god-awful defending. Track back Yedlin. For center half, Jeff Cameron was the veteran while promising John Brooks was not too far behind. Brooks was an established defender for Bundesliga club Hertha Berlin, and it gave Americans hope the defense wouldn't be in complete shambles, because man, if you look at the rest of the depth chart... Oh dear lord. Defensive midfield? Michael Bradley. That's it. I couldn't possibly see how that would go wrong. For attacking midfield, I just want to show you the depth chart that was provided by Stars and Stripes FC. The first two options are a number six and a center forward. And the rest of the list? One thing to point out is that this article came out in March 2016. I get Pulisic didn't do much in his first few senior matches with Dortmund, but worse than Mix Diskerud? Did I mention that Fabian Johnson was also our best left winger? Oh, and who was our best right winger? The less said, the better. Clint Dempsey for a while had been the US's best player. Josie Altidore usually was his striking partner as the US for the last 200 years had tried every single formation known to man to get the most of the two. Bobby Wood wasn't far off the pace and was another promising figure after displaying some incredible performances in his first caps against the Netherlands and Germany. He has the same birthday as me too. The United States began their final round of qualifiers with a match against Mexico and Columbus the only city in which the US can play knowing the Mexican fans won't fill the majority of seats. The US-Mexico rivalry has a long history, whether it be the infamous Dos Acera at the 2002 World Cup, Giovanni Dos Santos single-handedly dismantling the US team which I watched at just 10 years old on Univision, Funny Tall Man makes fun of Short Man, and of course, my favorite, the Mexicans losing the Gold Cup to the USZ team. This rivalry over the years has made fans, American or Mexican, develop a fiery hatred for one another. Two completely different footballing cultures clashing with nothing but pure resentment for one another. This is my kind of rivalry. The match began, and 10 minutes in, the US already looked completely outclassed. By the 20th minute, we would witness a Michael Bradley masterclass as he gave the ball away, leading to a deflected Miguel Ayun shot that went past him Howard. Just to make things worse, Howard then tore his abductor muscle, deeming him out of this match and the next qualifier versus Costa Rica. But in the second half, with Clint Dempsey missing an action, Bobby Wood came to save the day as the US went flying out early on. Fast forward to the 89th minute after constant end-to-end -end entertainment Mexico had a corner and the possibility to score. Alright, pause. What the f? Out of everyone you could have possibly left alone, 
you left Rafa Marquez wide open. And that's not even the worst part. Who's marking the back post? Who? The US performance overall was pretty underwhelming. The midfield in particular was appalling with Michael Bradley practically being Mexico's 12th man with how many times he gave the ball away. However, Bobby Wood and Christian Pulisic gave the supporters some optimism with some decent performances. November 15th, 2016. It was my sweet 16 when the US traveled to San Jose to take on Costa Rica. History was not on our side. Los Ticos before the match had an all-time record of 8 wins and 1 draw versus the Stars and Stripes. But tonight was going to be a different story. Los Ticos made it 9 wins after they thrashed the Americans 4-0. On November 21st, 2016, after a stretch of awful form, head coach Jurgen Klinsmann was sacked by the US Federation. Well now that he's gone, I guess... Going into their third qualifier against Honduras, the red, white, and blue were bottom of the table. But things only got worse when the US had some injury problems, including Bobby Wood, Fabian Johnson, and DeAndre Yedlin. <laughs> Even with the missing pieces, we're fine. We're going to have 11 good players on the field on Friday, Bruce Arena said in a press conference. And he was right, as the United States tore Honduras to shreds winning 6-0 in comfortable fashion. Speaking of fashion, these red kits were not. But most importantly, the US finally had a statement win that would bump them up to fourth with a plus one goal difference. Watch out, folks. The Americans are back on track. Spoke too soon? Quick analysis of the match. For all this talk about athleticism and strength the Americans always possess, they sure looked weak with Panama bullying them throughout the entire match. But four points in two matches. Not terrible, Bruce. The fifth qualifier versus Trinidad was held in the great state of Colorado. Christian Pulisic was truly bursting on the scene as he scored a brace to help the US win 2-0, but that wasn't even the best part of the match. This was. Say what you will about how it took 50 minutes for the US to finally break down Trinidad, but Arena's team had two wins in their last three, bumping them up to third in the hex. But here came the team's biggest test. Mexico at the Estadio Azteca. This was a place where the US had never won a qualifier at. In fact, to this day, they still haven't. Oh, and don't forget, this was the year of our Lord 2017. This son of a bitch here didn't just add one can of fuel. He added the whole f***ing gas station to the fire that is US-Mexico relations. So now the US had the combination of not just a quality Mexico side, not just the high altitude, but the extreme hostility built upon recent politics and ethics, or lack thereof. Now before this match, all Michael Bradley knew was eat hot chip, ball watch, and lose ball. But today was different when he scored a brilliant wonder goal. Call it the damn Hail Mary if you will, but this was a dream start for the US. But you ever had that great dream at night? Maybe you just achieved your life's goals, or your brain played that dream where you were with her. Well, like all great dreams, you awake from them being greeted by the unwelcoming sound of your Apple alarm clock. Both teams had the chance to find a winner, albeit Mexico the better opportunities, but in the end, the match ended with a draw thanks to a valiant effort from the US defense. It was just the third time that the US drew at the Azteca. Coming off a Gold Cup win, the Stars and Stripes had second place Costa Rica and New Jersey. While all preparation for the match was going on, ESPN on the other hand were introducing this isolation camera. Basically, there would be a camera focusing on one star player. I personally like to call this the Zion Cam. In theory, the idea sounds really cool, but that night, any viewer would have been disappointed. Costa Rica in every aspect of the match outplayed the Americans. And can someone tell me what the f Michael Bradley is doing here? At that point, just don't even play a defensive midfielder. Honestly, that might have somehow worked better. And look at this tw Oh, just San Pedro Sula Honduras. The Americans badly needed a result. Bruce Arena before the match said, Obviously, the field we're playing on tomorrow, nobody plays on fields like that. So that's a bit well, challenging. It it's a little spicy too. Happen. Remember, Who knows what we must forget that it's been raining, so... The pitch is quite... It's been raining? Yeah. Are you being serious? God, it's raining for both teams! 26 minutes in, Honduras picked out a great pass with Graham Zussi dusted. But no problem, Omar Gonzalez was still doing a good job on coverage. Well covered by Omar, reaches back though, Lozano has it, tucks it around, off the post and in! We cannot, we cannot replace him! The Stars and Stripes were already chasing the match, and if you remember, they needed at least a point. Honduras did a phenomenal job absorbing the attack and running on the counter. On a different day, this team wins 3-0, but in some miraculous sequence of events, a scuffle in the box sees the ball fall right to Bobby Wood, who thwarts it home. And the US escape with a lucky point. A couple days later during a live match broadcast, Alexi Lalas, the man of zero hits and 16,000 misses, went on a rant about the uninspiring performances from the United States. Tim Howard. Tim. 
The Belgium game ended three years ago. We need you to save the ball now. Clint Dempsey, yeah, you're a national team legend. Now we need you to be a national team leader. Michael Bradley, the U.S. does not need you to be zen. The U.S. needs you to play better. Josie Altidore, is this really as good as it gets? Because it's still not good enough. Bruce Arena, Bruce, Jurgen Klinsmann lost at home to Mexico. You lost at home to Costa Rica. This is now all on you, not Jurgen. Oh, and by the way, to all the guys that I didn't mention, it because you don't even warrant a mention. That includes you too, Wonder Boy. So, what are you guys gonna do? Are you going to continue to be a bunch of soft, underperforming, tattooed millionaires? You are a soccer generation that has been given everything. You are a soccer generation who is on the verge of squandering everything. You know things are f***ed when Alexi, there's AC in the Qatari stadium's Lalas, is speaking nothing but facts. October's international break held the last two CONCACAF World Cup qualifiers, and Bruce Arena's squad call-ups had many supporters concerned. Fabian Johnson was injured for a while, but played Munch and Gladbach's last two matches with no problems. Bruce didn't seem to care though, because Johnson was left out completely. Say what you will about Johnson's bad form as of recent, but leaving out your most accomplished player in Europe and your most versatile player is a terrible decision. That wasn't the only awful decision though. Striker Giazzi Zardes was in the worst form of his career and got called up by Bruce Arena. Bruce also added Benny Failhaber and Chris Wondolowski. <sighs> Jesus Christ, man. Luckily for the fans though, Christian Pulisic saved us from all the Bruce aids as the 18-year-old put on a show of nothing but attacking art. He scored a goal, assisted another, helping the US win 4-0 against Panama. And with that win, the United States were placed in the last automatic qualification spot, with just one match left. Trinidad and Tobago managed just a measly three points up to this stage of the competition. Needing a win to guarantee World Cup qualification, this was a best case scenario for the Americans. But before a ball was even kicked, there was quite a controversy which really shouldn't have been. Bruce Arena mentioned he was not impressed with the pitch conditions. The problem in hand was mainly Trinidad Stadium, which had a massive flood around the track area, leaving many concerned. But while this was happening, there was this weird overconfidence you could feel in the US camp. It was almost like they were overlooking Trinidad, with the idea they were pretty much in the World Cup already. October 10th. Match day arrives, and lo and behold, the pitch is not even that bad. But 16 minutes in, Trinidad had a chance to Alvin Jones, whose cross was dealt with terribly by Omar Gonzalez, resulting in an own goal for the US. <laughs> not even a minute later, Trinidad should have had a penalty thanks to another Omar Gonzalez masterclass. But the US were lucky enough to get away with no call. And just when you thought the Soka Warriors were done, Alvin Jones solidified that the US was his bitch as he scored a 35-yard screamer. It was 2-0 to Trinidad and Tobago. And at this point, I was in complete disbelief. <laughs> Halftime finally arrived as many like myself wondered how the hell the US were gonna turn this one around. The Americans throughout the entire first half had very few opportunities and not a single shot on target. But although losing terribly, the US were still qualifying if results stood in the other matches. The second half saw the introduction of Clint Dempsey, but it was Christian Pulisic who found the net early. It was now 2-1, with plenty of time to find another goal or two. I actually believe we could have made a comeback like the good old days. Oh, how I was so wrong. The attitude didn't change at all after halftime. The team energy was genuinely lower than a FIFA career mode YouTuber working on episode 124 of their underperforming Road to Glory series. There was also not a lick of cohesion between the three lines. Nothing could possibly be created. And Michael Bradley covering our entire midfield was making me contemplate driving a fork through my eyes. Oh, what's this? Panama found an equalizer? Eh, don't worry, we're still safe. You know, they just can't score again. Honduras have drawn level against Mexico for the second time, huh? Okay, but we're still qualifying, just as long as they don't score again. Well, the US are still in the playoff spot. We'll be fine. Oh my god, f***ing kill me now. It took just 28 minutes for the US to go from 3rd down to 5th in the table. I remember seeing this fiasco in 240p quality thinking to myself, how the hell is quite literally everything going wrong? But more importantly, I thought to myself, why the f*** are we losing to Trinidad? You would think after hearing the news, the United States would push up the field and get some great opportunities. Yeah, no. And thus ended the United States 2018 World Cup qualification campaign. They had a 93% chance of qualifying at the beginning of this match, and here they were standing at zero. It was inexcusable, and the players knew that, lying on the pitch in disbelief with some even in tears.
couple minutes after the match, I remember seeing people say, Oh, we helped Mexico in 2014, why didn't they help us? First off, you're a f***ing idiot if you had that take. Secondly, why the f*** would Mexico or Costa Rica play for us? That makes no sense whatso f***ing ever. If the US can't beat Trinidad and Tobago, then they don't deserve to be in the World Cup. End of. This American team was so arrogant throughout the entire qualification process. This team made the Los Angeles Clippers of 2020 look like saints. And why? It's the US men's team we're talking about. We are universally considered terrible. How on God's green f***ing earth can there be arrogance? Did we really think we were hot sh beating Jamaica to win the Gold Cup? There was a once in a lifetime moment in this godforsaken timeline where Alexi Lalas was actually speaking facts and every player said, oh, Alexi doesn't know what he's talking about. Well, guess what, you f***ing fools? You committed the worst atrocity this sport has ever seen proving Alexi right. And you, Bruce, you laissez fair mother f I knew from the very day the US Federation brought you in that we were so f Every match was an eyesore to watch because you'd be outplayed in every aspect possible by head coaches who had significantly less resources. Not one time did you think, damn, maybe Michael Bradley can't be Mayonnaise and Golo Conte. Oh, and don't even get me started on the hard on this man had for the MLS during the era the league was considered a retirement home. This dude looked at most Americans abroad like conservatives looking at a person of color. Winning is a mentality. It's about fighting for every ball, hunting for every opportunity, staring down your opponent and saying, you're not beating me today. Damn, Bruce, where the hell was this mentality during the Trinidad match? Staring down your opponent and saying, you're not beating me today? All you did was stare at the pitch and make excuses about how the surface wasn't covered by the most perfect blades of grass sent by the heavens. Oh, and you think I wasn't gonna talk about you, US Soccer Federation? It is because of you folk that our development is nowhere near where it could actually be. And hey, while we're at it, let's talk about pay to play, folks. Hey, Europeans, did you know on average it costs about $2,500 to $5,000 to join a club team? That's right. If you want to be the next Lionel Messi or Huang Hee Chan, you can kiss your hopes and dreams goodbye if you and your family can barely even scrape a living in this capitalist poisoned world. Pay to play does nothing but hurt the development of the sports and alienate marginalized communities. With pay to play, you will never see a story like Gabriel Jesus. There's a reason why football is considered a rich white kid sport in this country. And to the people who have the counter argument, well, nothing's stopping you from kicking a ball around with your friends, you are the football equivalent of poor, just get a job. Oh, homeless, just get a house. Okay, I'm done. With the US officially not going to Russia, Bruce Arena resigned soon after the match. Disappointment could be felt throughout the entire nation. Fears that the game would stall and growth lingered, and of course the nation became a worldwide laughing stock overnight. There was no feeling of heartbreak, just anger and disappointment. Waiting another four years to see the US potentially in the World Cup took some time to wrap around my head. I was angry, sick to my stomach. I didn't even want to go to school the next morning. And during the World Cup, Wells Fargo kept shoving this ad in our faces. Wells Fargo and I are inviting anyone in need of a team to root for to join us in cheering for the Mexican national team. F*** off, Landon, I'm not supporting Mexico! Now, four years after that infamous match at the Otto Bolden Stadium, the Stars and Stripes are in the middle of another World Cup qualification campaign. They're a promising bunch, but the trauma of Trinidad will loom over their heads, like an extra weight of pressure as this nation once again expects this team to qualify. I have hope, though. What a wonderful video essay to write about. Really, that was kind of just a therapy session for me. I have now finally gone through the acceptance segment of the five stages of grief. I'm sorry the rate of video essays is like once a month. I'm going to try and make it a little bit quicker, but also what would help is if you guys supported the Patreon, that would just allow me to use some other resources to make this a quicker process and also improve the video essays too. Speaking of Patreon though, shout out to our patrons, Lewis, Emmett Shea, Dominic Griffin, Joseph Bonfante, and Tomicus. Be sure to follow my Twitter, I tend to update quite frequently about video essays on that platform. You can also follow my Instagram, follow my TikTok if you want, trying to get to 2000, and you can also follow my Twitch. But until then, I'll see you guys.